Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for watching and thank you for being here. I know it is already November, but I can finally talk about uh, the movies and TV that I watched in September. Um, school got really busy for a while there, but the quarter is over, so I'm now free to do this. Um, and normally I would preface these videos by uh, talking about stuff that happened in the country recently, but there's just been way too much that happened and that's worth talking about over the last month, so I'll just leave the usual links down below and I will say that at the time of my recording this, uh, Raleigh the Typhoon is about to make landfall I believe. Stay safe and lock your things down and make sure you have water and ways to connect with other people. It's gonna be bumpy but hopefully we can all get through this. So without further ado, hopefully just to take your mind off uh, the typhoon and whatnot, Let's talk about some movies and TV that I saw in September. The first show I want to talk about, I'm not sure if you can see it on my screen, uh, is a new show called Pea Valley, which is a drama that's essentially about a group of people working in and around uh, a strip club in the fictional town of Chocolisa, Mississippi. I didn't really realize I was a fan of Pea Valley until like a few episodes in when I just suddenly discovered that I was in fact very invested in where these characters were going. Um, what I like about this show so much is that it feels incredibly authentic and original as far as these hour-long dramas go. Um, I love the fact that all the characters speak in a very thick Mississippi accent, uh, using a very specific vernacular to that region. Um, but, you know, just the way that the show is directed, it doesn't feel Hollywoodized at all. Um, it really does feel like you're just with these characters, the, all the pole routines are real and they happen on screen and they, they are feats of athleticism. And you can kind of tell that this show is based on a play written by the creator Katori Hall. I'm not really sure how to uh, justify the fact that you can tell it's a play. But, you know, it, it, this, this show just covers a whole range of topics from religion, sexuality, to domestic abuse, all under the main plot of gentrification and, you know, capitalism sort of destroying these small businesses. I don't think everything about the show works. Uh, in particular, I feel like there are certain characters, certain actors who don't really fit the show just yet. However, most of the actors who are here are really fantastic, and if they just keep up the good work, I'm sure season 2 will be just as great, if not better. Um, just to shout them out, um, Brandy Evans, Nico Nan, um, Harriet D. Foy, Shannon Thornton, and my favorite, J. Alphonse Nicholson, who plays this wannabe rapper so convincingly. Like, you, you, it doesn't really feel like any of them are acting, and that's one of the best compliments I can give it. The other show I want to talk about for this video is, in my opinion, maybe the best show of 2020. I'll have to think about it a little bit, but it's definitely up there, and that is Pen15, the first half of season 2. For those who don't know, Pen15 is really just this coming-of-age comedy drama about these two best friends, these two young girls in middle school in the year 2000, I believe. Um, who and they're, they're both weird kids. They're not very popular in school um, But they're also just trying to make their way through embarrassing situations and you know shameful memories and whatnot The hook of Ben 15 however is the fact that the, the two best friends Maya and Anna are played by Maya Erskine and Anna Conkel who are in their 30s and everyone around them all the other kids are actual kids and teenagers and it sounds really strange But it actually really works one of the things that makes Ben 15 really unique among other coming-of-age things is the fact that it's directed in such a surreal way um, and I don't think you know you would expect a coming-of-age comedy drama to be described as technically uh, brilliant but this one really is every single element uh, just adds to the feeling that you're watching this repressed memory that keeps sort of persisting and stays in the back of your head. None of this would work if Maya Erskine and Anna Conkle weren't as good as they are. And they are really, really Emmy-worthy, awards-worthy for like any awards show. Um, they turn in some of the funniest performances I've seen in a very long time, but they also broke my heart routinely throughout these seven episodes. Maya Erskine in particular reminds me so much of, not exactly me, but like she does this thing where when she's feeling embarrassed, she'll cling to whatever's like right next to her, whether it's like a locker or her bag or whatever, and like it just really took me back because I would do the exact same thing. I don't want to say too much about Pen15 yet just because the season isn't over and I can kind of see that they're still about to wrap up certain arcs. Um, however, I will say that I really love uh, the show's sort of outlook on, on um, you know, adolescence and whatnot. Uh, these seven episodes so far 
for me are really about these two girls trying to come to terms with things that are out of their control. You know, Maya is particularly unpopular at school and she, you know, has to deal with a lot of that shame while Anna is trying to work through her parents' divorce and she, of course, blames herself a little bit for that and the results are, you know, really funny, really heartbreaking, completely sincere and authentic. I love the show so much. If you have a Hulu account, you can definitely check it out. Now moving on to film, the first movie that I saw in September is a film called La Llorona. This has nothing to do with The Curse of La Llorona from The Conjuring Universe. This is a Guatemalan film that starts out with a military general who is tried and convicted for war crimes, for genocide against indigenous peoples. And while he's waiting at home to be taken away with his family, um, a, a protest begins to form around this house and they let in this new um, indigenous housekeeper and then things get kind of strange and eerie inside the house. I would still definitely classify La Llorona as a horror movie, but it does not play out the way that you think horror movies play out. It's not interested in catering to that kind of usual audience. Technically speaking, it is still really, really accomplished. Visually speaking, they get so much mileage out of just this one location, the, the house. Um, it begins to feel like a maze of sorts as these characters are walking around trying to catch like the spooky stuff that's happening. The sound design is fantastic as well. I love the fact that they really make use of the crowd that's formed around the house because you can always hear chanting or singing or just general noise. Um, throughout pretty much every scene and begins to feel like, you know, the, the general's guilty conscience intruding into the family's life. However, the most unique thing that La Llorona does is that it does something that Aswang did earlier this year, the documentary Aswang. It essentially repurposes a folk tale to speak truth to power. So if Aswang used the creature, the Aswang, to, you know, expose the, the brutality of the police, um, La Llorona takes this, you know, folk tale, this classic folk tale of this sort of insane, violent woman, and it changes her role and turns her into the victim of genocide. And she becomes frightening only because the characters who perceive her are afraid of what they've done and they feel guilty. And I think that's really, really interesting. It doesn't work all the time, but it is definitely worth checking out, I think. I watched a few documentaries as well uh, in September, and the first one I want to talk about is called Coup 53, which is essentially an account of how the CIA and MI6 um, instigated a coup to replace the democratically elected leader of Iran in 1953 with uh, the Shah, who was you know, backed by these imperialist countries. Now the subject matter of Coup 53 is nothing new at all, but because the film has so much detail, it's so extremely meticulously researched, um, the story does begin to feel fresh again. The problem with Coup 53 and the reason why I didn't enjoy it as much as I wanted to enjoy it is the fact that so much of this film, about 50% of it I would say, is dedicated to the director Taghi Amirani um, and him and his uh, own procedure, him and his own research, and him just sort of showing how he put the film together. Um, and I, do, I normally just don't like it when documentary directors put themselves front and center uh, in their film when they have no real reason to be there, when they don't have a special connection with the subject matter. So for me, you know, I, I do appreciate the fact that uh, Amirani is so enthusiastic about this research but it really just seems like he's making himself out to be the hero when he's not. However, when Coup 53 finally gets around to actually talking about the actual coup, um, it is very interesting, it is very tense, and Amirani uses some pretty interesting tricks like some animated sequences, the fact that they cast uh, Rafe Fiennes to play this shadowy MI6 agent, and he's actually in character reciting uh, those lines. So yeah, it's cool, it's just a missed opportunity because of the fact that, you know, Amirani himself takes up so much of the film. The next documentary is almost like a companion piece to Coup 53. It's called Desert One, um, but you know this has the, the production is completely different from Coup 53's. Uh, but this one takes place in the late 70s um, when uh, the Iranian people stormed into the U.S. embassy and took hostages because of the whole coup thing. And Desert One focuses specifically on this one rescue mission that was planned and failed. Um, to extract the U.S. diplomats from Iran. Just like Coup 53, when this film finally gets around to retelling the central event, it is extremely suspenseful, which is 
really impressive for this movie because the central mission doesn't actually have a lot of action to it, but it's still really haunting and you really feel the pain of what happened. However, overall, while I was hoping for this documentary to be better than Crew 53, it actually wasn't in my opinion. The thing that really brought it down in quality in my opinion is the fact that it's, it is so incredibly one-sided and it completely favors the American narrative over the Iranian narrative. The film does involve Iranian voices and we get to hear them speak about their perspective on what happened. However, as the film goes on, um, it just begins to feel like they're taking sound bites from the Iranians and making them seem intentionally callous and cruel and savage and making the Americans look completely sympathetic. And I just don't think that's fair. I feel like it's impossible to ignore the fact that uh, the US and, and uh, Britain really were uh, responsible for the unrest that happened in Iran because of the whole coup. So the fact that this movie glosses over that, to me, like, it just doesn't cut it. So, yeah. Now, easily the best documentary I saw in September is Nomad in the Footsteps of Bruce Chatwin, which is the latest documentary from Werner Herzog. It's essentially his farewell letter slash love letter to his late friend, the travel writer Bruce Chatwin. In this film, Herzog goes to different places that Chatwin wrote about or different places where both him and Chatwin had like a common experience. And there's no real like common thread or theme among all the different places that Herzog visits, but I guess the most common element is the fact that Chatwin really loved the unknown and the unexplainable. So a lot of the things that Herzog examines in this movie are these ancient customs and traditions and like, you know, ancient animals and whatnot. And all of this is given to us with some really fantastic imagery. It really feels like a travelogue. Um, as well as an incredibly eclectic score. It's one of my favorite scores of the year. It's just so weird and eerie and bizarre and just completely fits. Also, Werner Herzog makes for a fantastic tour guide. If you have ever heard this guy speak, you know he speaks in a very particular way. He has a way of articulating himself. He has some very dry humor. Um, and he just, he's like a perfect sort of central part of this documentary and I would listen to him for hours on end. But what Herzog also does is that he recites some of Chatwin's words, he has their mutual friends recite some of Chatwin's words, and Chatwin is such a good writer and it brings these images to life. Um, and it really hammers home the fact that this movie isn't just a travelogue, it is an ode to the friendship between, between these two men. Um, and what I love is that uh, you know, in the face of all these unknowns, uh, Herzog faces the perhaps the most you know unknowable question, which is death and what happened to Chatwin after his death and whatnot. And through this movie, I feel like Herzog really makes peace with that, um, and he you know reassures himself that his friend may be gone, but all these places that they've you know experienced together, they will remain forever. Now moving back to fiction films, let's talk about Bill and Ted Face the Music, which is of course the sequel to Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, but this time Bill and Ted are grown, they're adults, they're married, they both have daughters, but one day they're contacted by people from the future who tell them, hey, you were supposed to have written the song that saves the multiverse by now, and if you don't uh, write it and perform it in like 24 hours or something, like everything is just going to be destroyed. So they go set off and look for the song that they wrote. The thing with these Bill and Ted movies is that they're not the smartest comedies around. They're actually pretty dumb. Um, and this movie is no different. It is not clever, really. Um, so much of the movie is spent sort of repeating the same kinds of jokes and whatnot. They don't really focus on the real central relationship in the film, which is between Bill and Ted and their daughters. So there's a lot of missed opportunities in Bill and Ted Face the Music, however, I think this is one of the few movies that I would call just impossible to dislike. It is so aggressively endearing and wholesome and sweet. And you know, it all it really wants is to put a smile on your face and to make you feel good. It is the definition of a feel-good movie. What makes Bill and Ted so special is the fact that, you know, these two characters are just so kind to each other and so kind to other people. Uh, and the, the worldview of these movies has always been one of just like carefree, um, you know, excellence to each other and whatnot. If I saw this movie in any other year, I feel like it wouldn't have affected me as much. But in 2020, it's exactly the movie I needed. Um, I, I had tears in my eyes by the end, it was ridiculous. And because the movie is called Bill and Ted Face the Music, of course the music is really, really great. Again, there's nothing really original about the music here. 
um, but the way that it's used I really love and I love the fact that they emphasize the point that what's important isn't necessarily the music, it's more of the fact that people are collaborating to make music together. Uh, I really believe that as well and it just puts such a smile on my face, it is such a pleasant movie. Uh, I really, really loved it. Next up, let's talk about I'm Thinking of Ending Things, which is the new Charlie Kaufman film, which is about a young woman who goes to the countryside with her boyfriend to meet her boyfriend's parents. But once they get to the house, weird things start to happen and reality seems to start to unravel. I'm Thinking of Ending Things is a movie that I've slowly fallen out of since I first saw it. Um, at the end of the day, I really just don't think it amounts to much. I don't really like what it ends up being. However, I will still say that the experience of watching it was completely unforgettable. I still think it is an impeccably made film. I really do love Charlie Coffin's direction in this. He makes every single moment eerie. Um, something is always off, even in scenes that seem completely normal. And I feel like every single like technical department was on the same page for this movie. Like Every single element really came together and every single element really felt like it needed to be there. Even more impressive, however, is the fact that Jesse Buckley, who plays the young woman, you know, takes this character who's essentially supposed to be a cipher and she's, you know, deliberately supposed to be vague and she infuses this character with like a really consistent um, emotional arc and I am just so impressed that she managed to pull that off when, you know, she could have easily gotten away with just being like quirky and changing her personality with every sort of iteration of this character. And again, while I don't really enjoy anymore where this movie ends up, I still think that dialogue-wise, it's really well written. I like the fact that so much of the dialogue is just intentionally faux intellectual and how they keep cycling like different topics and different personalities and whatnot. It's just fun to listen to, I think, and you know, the way the dialogue is written, technically speaking, I find very almost musical at times. So yeah, it's not as great as I said it was at the very be at the first time. Um, but I still do think it's a pretty memorable film. Next movie I want to talk about is a small psychological drama called The Swerve, which is about Holly, uh, played by Azura Sky, who is this uh, woman, mother of two, um, who is living this perfectly mundane, boring life, but one day she just sort of begins to unravel. This is a really surprisingly well-directed film for a movie that clearly doesn't have as much of a budget behind it. Um, I think they do a really good job of making the mundane feel horrific. Um, you know, nothing actually happens in this movie in terms of horror stuff. That's not a spoiler to say. Um, but every single moment feels like a ticking time bomb. It really just feels like something is wrong somewhere. Similar to I'm thinking of ending things. If there's any reason to really go out and watch this movie, it's the fact that the lead actress Azura Sky is so good. Um, she really transforms throughout this movie in very subtle ways. Um, as the movie goes on, it actually begins to feel like her eyes are sinking back farther into her head. Um, and she really pulls that off. Like, it's, it's such a great performance for a movie that ultimately I kind of hated. The problem with The Swerve to me is the fact that it is so unrelentingly cruel to its protagonist for no reason, I think. This is really just misery porn that, you know, its, it's, it's deepest insight is the fact that um, pressure can come from a thousand different places and a thousand different microaggressions and whatnot, and that can weigh down on a person, but we already know that. Um, I just don't think Holly is a well-written character. I don't think her world is very well-defined. Um, if the point is that suffering like doesn't need to have a meaning or whatever, I don't buy that because, um, I mean, I don't know, that doesn't necessarily send any sort of message or idea. At the end of the day, this is just a movie that really, you know, takes this character who is clearly mentally ill, who has suicidal ideation, and it makes her seem uh, frightening, it makes her seem dangerous, and I feel like we are so far past that idea already of making mentally ill characters dangerous to other people. So I just, I really couldn't buy into it. I don't understand the acclaim that the film has gotten. Next up for something a little lighter, let's talk about Enola Holmes, which is based on the YA book series about Sherlock Holmes's uh, long lost sister, sort of, who goes off on her own mysteries to solve. Just like I'm thinking of ending things, I feel like I enjoy Enola Holmes less the more I think about it. However, I do still think it is a very good movie. 
Um, but it's definitely not great yet. I feel like the movie kind of oversells the character of Enola. I feel like directorially, Harry Bradbeer does a lot of things that I just think are unnecessary. I think that the film doesn't really know how to limit her abilities just yet. Like, she just comes off being the luckiest and one of the most capable young people ever. And while that is, you know, f fine and all, um, there's just a point where it feels like she isn't necessarily being challenged as much as she should be. And while I know that this is aimed towards slightly younger viewers, I do think that the way it talks about revolution it just isn't enough. Um, it kind of dismisses it in favor of reform and whatnot, and in certain situations I feel like um, you have to be a little more nuanced with that. With all that said, I would be lying if I said I didn't really, really enjoy watching this film, surprisingly. Um, what I liked about it so much is that it's so much darker and so much more, so much more mature than I was expecting. Um, it really reminded me of, you know, YA family movies from the 80s and the 90s where the children were actually placed in mortal danger. And you can really see it in the film's action sequences. There's, there's some really impressive action scenes here with real fight choreography where they're throwing children through walls and throwing things at children and whatnot, and they really sell it. And while I do think that the film is imperfect and that the character still needs to be better defined, I really enjoy the screenplay because I feel like it's not just going through the motions of having like an adventure for a precocious uh, youngster and then throwing them into various like comedic and you know action heavy sequences I feel like the screenplay actually has a main thesis and it turns out to be that this movie is about um, children who are neglected and abused and lost and it just spends a lot of time examining how they feel about them being in this world that doesn't care about them but it's a world that they're still going to inherit and they, they demand to have a say in how it's treated. And I really, really enjoy that. I think it's very timely as well. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to a sequel if they're making a sequel. If you want to talk about a really bad movie though, let's talk about Secret Society of Second Born Royals, which is a Disney Plus original movie that I have no idea why I watched. It's really just a teen superhero team-up kind of movie where a bunch of second-born children of these kings and queens discover that they have superpowers and they, you know, have to train and stuff like that to be like secret agents. When I compare this movie to a Disney Channel original movie, I don't mean it as a positive. This is not like High School Musical. This is not like you know, Cadet Kelly or whatever. The production of this is just awful. Um, the editing is terrible, the, there's no money behind the production design and the visual effects, and just creates so many moments of unintentional hilarity. And unlike the Disney Channel original movies I mentioned, unlike a movie like Sky High, this movie just doesn't have like that sense of camp to it, doesn't have that sense of fun, it doesn't feel very sincere either. It just feels really bland. It's like a pilot episode for a show that's already been cancelled. But the thing that really bothered me about this movie is the fact that it's just so aggressively pro-rich people and pro-royalty. Uh, um, you know, the only special people in, in this movie are the, the children of, of royalty, and I don't know what kind of message they're trying to send out to ordinary kids out there. Um, and then, of course, the main antagonist, not a spoiler to say, is a guy who has the real bone to pick with the queen for very good reasons, but the characters just sort of treat him like a straight-up villain. It's just, it's horrib horribly conceived, it's not nuanced at all. Um, yeah, I don't know why I watched this. But finally, the best movie that I saw in September, in my opinion, is a very small independent film called Bloody Nose Empty Pockets, directed by brothers Bill Ross and Turner Ross IV. Uh, this movie is really just documenting the last 24 hours of this dive bar in Las Vegas and it just follows all the bar regulars as they say goodbye to the place they once called home. I am so impressed with what uh, the Ross brothers did with this movie because it's not a documentary, but it feels almost indistinguishable from a Cinema Verite documentary. I mean, you can see the cameras in mirrors and like they, they don't even try to hide it. So it really, it feels like they've really replicated the feel of a documentary, but 
apparently it is a fiction film. I mean, even all the sound mixing feels real. Um, the movie is really just made up of random conversations that don't necessarily connect with each other. But even as you watch all these disjointed conversations, you gain a real sense of community and warmth among these people, and you begin to feel the weight of what they're about to lose. I don't really want to say that Bloody Nose Empty Pockets is about anything in particular, because I feel like that's not really the point. However, the main insight that I got from it was the fact that you really get to see how these people are coping with the loss of their home, so to speak. What's really interesting is that actually most of the characters really refuse to make a big deal out of it. And some of them are just completely, like, they, they put on a really straight face and just sort of get out of there as soon as they can. And it's important to note that all the regulars at the Roaring Twenties, which is the name of the bar, they're all sort of down on their luck. Um, they're all kind of broken people. They admit that they're not, like, the best people ever. Um, and I feel like the reason why they don't want to acknowledge the, the fact that the bar is closing down is because once they make a big deal out of that, they admit to themselves that they really only go to this bar because they're lost and they're broken, and they don't want to face that reality, so they just treat the bar as if it's just, you know, another day, which is incredibly fascinating to me. If the Oscars had a Best Casting Award, this would win in a heartbeat, Every single actor here just looks like they walked in from the street, and I don't know how they cast this movie, but it's, it's incredible. Um, and it really speaks to how good the ensemble is, because every single one of them, like, they had me second-guessing myself. I really thought this was a documentary at multiple points. You could single out any one of these actors, and they have turned in a more convincing performance than probably any other actor in a fact-based story this year. However, I will single out two people in particular. Um, number one is Bruce Hadnot, who is the who plays this war veteran at the end of the bar who speaks kind of unintelligibly and he's clearly sort of shell-shocked. But he's the one who shows the most emotion. He's the one who feels the passing of the bar the hardest and he really made me well up with tears as well. And the other actor I want to mention is Michael Martin who is the closest person to a lead actor you have in this movie and he's absolutely brilliant. I think he turns in one of the best performances of the year. His character is very charismatic and very intelligent and he likes striking up conversations with different people but whenever he's left alone you begin to see just how desperate he is to cling to something, to cling to, cling to anybody who's willing to listen to him because he really can't take the fact that the bar is closing down and I just think he creates such a brilliant character almost in the background. So yeah, if you can somehow catch Bloody Nose Empty Pockets, I think it is absolutely worth it. It's very very strange, it's very unorthodox, um, there's no plot whatsoever, um, but I, it's so special, it's so unique, so I would highly recommend it. Alright, so those are my thoughts on everything that I watched in September. Again, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for watching. I hope you all continue to stay safe, not just from the pandemic, but from this typhoon that's coming. Please, 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 um, I pray for all of your safety. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. And if you have anything that you want to say about anything that I just talked about, please do leave me a comment and let's have a conversation.